Is this the perfect daddy? Yeah, he's good, but can we get him? Maybe. Lives in California in the desert. He works for $500 a day, if he likes the story. Plus, we'll have to send him a round-trip ticket. I think he's what you're looking for. The original daddy of gay porn, Richard Locke, burst onto the gay erotic film scene in 1974 and quickly became a fixture among gay men who were into the rugged and sexy male look that differed from the films that were coming out of California. But Richard Locke was more of a renaissance man all rolled into one human. On this episode, we're going to celebrate Richard Locke, the macho gay male porn star, regarded as having been an integral part of a highly developed star system in gay adult films with a filmography and physique that helped shape and define the parameters of gay adult film. This is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Laika Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped you get off. Before we continue, I want to remind you that you can help this channel and its original yet risque content by liking, clicking the subscribe button, or selecting the bell icon for notifications to see more content like this. And for all you podcast listeners, leave a review or rate it if you can. Thank you. Richard Haltlock was born on June 11, 1941, in East Oakland, California, and was raised by his parents with his brother, writer Robert Locke. Both Locke and his younger brother were gay, and though there was a bit of reluctance from his mother at first, their parents were supportive of their sons. Locke would graduate from Pleasant Hill High School, join the army, and be stationed in Germany as a tank mechanic. Once he finished his tour, Locke would return to California and attend Chico State University, majoring in history and aesthetics of film. Locke had contemplated a life in film, but realized early on, in order to make films in Hollywood, you had to have money, know somebody, or be in a union. Five years later, while in Hollywood, Locke met somebody that asked him if he wanted to be in a movie. A rather different film where actors would take their clothes off, but a film altogether. One of Locke's first film roles was in Passing Strangers, directed by Arthur J. Bresson in 1974. Later that year, Locke would be featured in Dreamer, an adult film by director Jim West. But Locke would go on to gain a cult following after his recurring role as Hank in Joe Gage's Working Man trilogy, Kansas City Trucking Company, El Paso Wrecking Corps, and L.A. Two Will and Die. Locke developed a working relationship with directors Joe Gage and Arthur J. Bresson. Locke struck up a conversation with Bresson after attending the screening of his short film Boys, and the two remained friends afterwards. Bresson would go on to write Forbidden Letters with Richard Locke in mind and was shot over a period of five years. Locke would go on to have a prolific career, appearing in films throughout the rest of the 70s and the mid-1980s. Locke's success was contributed to his overt sexual positivity, his age, his body frame, and dark hair. Locke really was tall, dark, and handsome. How long have you been here? Two and a half years. You got a lot done in that time. Uh-huh. Well, it's been slow because of the money situation, but uh, it's come along. I got my wind generator, and it is really doing well. Locke had an insatiable interest in the 21st century, believing that a big problem facing the world was overpopulation and the waste we leave behind. He moved to the desert and began to build the 21st century house. As it was, Locke always considered his career as a porn star secondary to his career as a solar house designer and builder. I'm going to use some reflectors like that on my solar collector for my hot water heater. Uh-huh. And I'll put flaps on both sides of the collector. And they'll have aluminum facing it. Yeah. And at night they'll be closed on top of it so that the cold won't get into it. And in the morning you open them up like this. And the sun reflects on the one in the morning, and the other one in the afternoon, so that it, it gets constant double heat all day long. Locke had been fascinated with solar energy and living off the land from an early age. In 1975, he settled on an old soldier settlement property and built a geodesic domed home powered by electricity from his own windmill. You know, you can become self-sufficient here. You don't have to pay a thing. You're, you're growing your groceries and whatever. So my tax is ten dollars a year because I live in the desert. Nobody wants to live in the desert, <laughs> you know. But for me, it's me. The wind is fantastic. I pray for it. I like it because the wind generator picks up and you can hear it. It goes. <laughs> 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 
1983, Locke was diagnosed with HIV and retired from adult cinema and became an HIV AIDS activist. He received an education from the American Red Cross, Gay Men's Health Crisis in New York City, and Michael Callan and Richard Berkowitz's book, How to Have Sex in an Epidemic, one of the first reading materials developed for the gay community during the HIV AIDS epidemic. Locke would use his celebrity to make appearances at sensible sex seminars to try and influence a younger generation. Around the same time, Locke became a regular visitor to Ward 5B, the first inpatient AIDS ward in the country in San Francisco General Hospital, where he entertained patients, served brunch, and gave massages to people with AIDS. Locke would also travel to Mexico routinely for HIV drugs and distribute them in an underground clinic in Sacramento. Locke would also write for the Bay Area Reporter, giving numbers of interviews and writing safe sex columns, eventually releasing a book of collected material called In the Heat of Passion, How to Have Hotter, Safer Sex. Locke's last performance in a film was a non-sexual role in Jerry Douglas's The Diamond Stud. How long? Two minutes. Two minutes to denounce the Inquisitor. Two minutes to just wear your undying love for The Diamond Stud. Two minutes to deny any plans for divorce. And a quick kiss kiss. He moved back to Desert Hot Springs near Palm Springs, but with his health failing, Locke relocated to an apartment in Sacramento to be close to his family and medical facilities. I've had some very good friends throughout the years. Sexual friends as well as friend friends. And uh, especially in this epidemic, I've learned that the most important thing that we have when all is said and done and we're ready to go wherever we're going to go when we die. The most important thing that you've had in your lifetime are friends. If you don't love yourself, nobody else is going to love you, no matter how many Prince Charmers come down the road. If you don't love yourself, they're not going to love you either, and they're not going to take care of you. And what happens when you have love of yourself, then you find it's easy to love other people, and not only that, it's easy for other people to love you. Love never stops. It's like light energy. Once light shoots off into space, it goes on forever. There's nothing to stop it. And that's the way it is with love. And once you've loved someone, that love exists and can never, ever be taken away. On September 25th, 1996, Richard Holt Locke, died of AIDS-related lymphoma. Richard Locke would begin his career with one word, yes. A word that could have possibly been the title of his autobiography. I said yes. From there, Locke would go on to work with great pioneering directors of gay erotic cinema, from Arthur Bresson to Joe Gage to Toby Ross and Wakefield Poole. As a performer, Locke always felt he had an obligation to the men living in small cities, far from the major gay centers like New York, San Francisco, or Los Angeles. As a futurist, Locke had hopes of building hundreds of solar homes. A truly proud gay man, helping his community as well as he could through one of the darkest periods. As many of these men that came before us, he was gone too soon. However, Locke once said, the best thing about film is that he will live a long time, even after he's gone. You've been watching Demons to Find Gay Porn. I am your host, Ike Grande. Demystifying Gay Porn is available wherever you get your podcasts, as well as YouTube. Demystifying Gay Porn is on X, Instagram, Facebook, Telegram. And if you like what you're watching or listening to and want to be a part of the creative process, head over to patreon.com backslash demystifying gay porn, where you can help support this audiovisual podcast and YouTube channel, and I can continue making content like you've just enjoyed. Once again, this is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Cheers.